This program is brought to you in part by Pro Am Embroidery. Pro Am Embroidery for all your embroidery needs. Call us at 781 662 8888. Or better yet, come see us at our brand new location at 139 Linwood Avenue in Melrose, Mass. Pro Am, a proud supporter of Wizbang Productions and MMTV. in Brookline, Mass. It's a beautiful place. It's, it has everything you'd want for a car show, and it happens to be one of the beautiful lawn events. This time it's for the English cars, uh, it, it, and I I'm, I'm just can't wait to see what has arrived here to show. They usually approach uh, the, 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 the highest quality of cars that you can ever expect to see at an auto show. Now, this is gonna be all British cars. British makes uh, and probably maybe some kit cars. I don't know, but I haven't seen the the the, the field yet. But I'm 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 guarantee you that it's going to be something to see, something to watch, and I can't wait to get started. So let's see what we've got. But every now and then, the starter will come. So it had a loop to start. Well, they're fixed for that, but apparently it must have been a problem. I know. This morning is somebody that's we had a car that it was really kind of close to my heart, uh, but I had his little brother. Uh, this is what's known as a Triumph GT6, which is to me the, the the one step up that my car really needed. And the owner is Spencer Gooder. And spent how long? How long have you owned this vehicle? I actually uh, bought it eight years ago. I had it in storage for six years, and then I started restoring it two years ago, and I pretty much just finished. So this is a restoration, not yes. this isn't the way it was. Oh no, it was uh, somebody had sanded off all the paint and managed to sand the glass and uh, and stuck it aside, and it sat. Before I got it, it sat for 25 years. Wow, so it's now, been a long time off the road. So how much of the glass did you have to replace? Uh, windshield, side windows, and the quarter windows, but I couldn't get those moved. I had to find those used. There are a few things that are difficult to get on these cars, but most everything else uh, is readily available for a price. I remember somebody telling me that this was just a Chevy, a Chevy straight six. Uh, it's Triumph 6, Triumph design. It actually started life as uh, a design for tractors, so it's very robust. Typical. Yes, it's uh, it's bulletproof if it's done properly. It's heavy, it's cast iron, but uh, reliable. Can you give me some specifications on it, or power, things like that? It's two liters and originally about 90 horsepower. If you want to, you know, get it to near exploding, you can get 200 horsepower out of it, but that's risky. Right now this. Did you have to do any major modifications to the engine at all? Pardon me? I upgraded it with a camshaft. They gave it and to me different when I pulled in. Drive and valves and uh, intake and carburetors and so on and so on. So right. yes, it's yeah. internally it's pretty well modified. Well, you've done a wonderful job on Thank it. I mean, you. it's very clean, very, you know, the biggest thing about any car really to me, and this is my personal mm -hmm. view. Uh, the difference between people that do American hot rods, which are beautiful, sure, you know, in their own way, but their way of making things beautiful is chrome and, and, and you know, crazy paint jobs and all that stuff. Horsepower and noise. Well, that's, I mean, that's that's a big part of it, you know, as long as you're going in a straight line. 
But the fact of the matter is, is that to me, the, the European view on uh, the way things look is it, it, it's a more sophisticated. You Absolutely. Know, things, things and the are, approach of higher revs, lighter weight, it's complete uh, opposite of an American muscle. You just you just quoted my hero, Colin Chapman. Oh yeah. Because I, I owned a Lotus at one time. And his theory was that if it didn't make it go faster or handle better, it didn't need to you be didn't there. need it. Yes. I actually have a uh, Lotus Cortina that's my next project. Another no. bucket list car. That's a beauty, though. Oh, that, was, that was a championship car for a lot of things. And they're kind of um, understated sedan. Yeah. They don't look the part externally. No, they don't. No. They don't. They don't. Uh, but getting back to this. I would say that this is probably one of the best triumphs I've seen lately. It's I'd better. like to think yeah, so. It, the only thing I worry about is, since Triumph went out of business some years ago, where do you go for your parts? Uh, domestically, Moss Motors, but they have a limited amount of GT6 parts. Unless you can figure out what was on a Spitfire, then you're good. Uh, if you want GC6 parts, you have to go to Rimmer Brothers in England, and they have sewn up the GT6, and I think there's some contractual limitations for Moss Motors. But there are some other domestic uh, suppliers as well. So the parts availability is, is really good. It's just it's kind of pricey. Yeah, as you... I mean, if a restoration like this, uh, car costs three times what it's worth. And, all and, 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 done. and how long did it take you to restore it? Oh, about two years. But two that's part-time. Yeah. So. But as far as I can see, it was well worth it. I really appreciate you uh, taking sure. your time. Certainly. You did a beautiful job. Thank you. And I'm very jealous because, like I said, I had the Spitfire, which wouldn't come close to this. But I appreciate your time. And certainly. did a great job. Enjoy the day. And we're moving on. The uh, uh, square. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. I put a... I put a uh, we're going from well I don't know this is this is this is this is a, another car that's pretty close to my heart because I always loved the minis uh, and the owner of this vehicle is Wendy Birchmeyer Wendy, um, how you doing today? It's pretty hot out here this morning, isn't it? It's very hot out here today, but it's worth coming out, it meeting is. all these people. It is. I, this is probably the one show I was really desperate to do, because I was always a British guy, because you could always tell by the oil in my garage floor. What are you thinking about? Uh, but anyways, how long have you owned the vehicle? What are you thinking about? About seven years. Did you have to do any restoration or anything to it? Uh, to tighten things up, I didn't really have to do restoration, but replace things, replace the cone. It doesn't have shock absorbers. Yeah, right. it has cones, so right. I had to replace the cone. Things like that. The one thing that attracted to me was this beautiful paint job. Nice, right, so isn't it? They call this Jack. This is Jack, the <laughs> Union Jack. Union Jack. <laughs> That's it, Union Jack. Now, did it come with that paint job on it? Yes, it did. It originally, when it left the factory, it was mauve, according to the oh, certificate. I can see why they changed the paint job. I can, too. The person who owned it ahead of me in Ohio changed the paint job. Mm. Well, I mean, can you give me some statistics? I mean, I noticed one thing, that it's right-hand drive. Well, that's the way the Minis came, right-hand drive. Well, I've seen them left-hand, but if, if it's really English, it's, it's right. It's got to be the authentic looking. Exactly, exactly. Now, do you have any trouble driving it that way? Not at all. You mean on the right-hand side? Well, no. my, my thing was shifting. No, but I have another one, and it, it's automatic, so the levers are on the other side. So like this morning when I went to put on the direction I put on the windshield wiper. <laughs> That's what happens all the time. It's which, which side has which? It, it takes a little brain power to switch it over. Well, I, was, I had to get into English mode here because before you started I asked you to open the bonnet. Yes, the boot and the bonnet. The boot and the bonnet, exactly. You don't say hood anymore. It's oh, not a hood no. in the trunk. It's a, it's not a if you're boot British. and <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so how, now, what do you, what's your favorite thing about the vehicle itself? It's just cute. I like it. Wherever it goes, it's a head turner. People wave and say hello and come over and want to talk about it. It's a it is. catcher. It's a unique vehicle. It really, is. especially the, the the original ones, because they're so small. But they have a, a, a legacy and a history 
of uh, really turning people's heads in many different ways because they were taking all kinds of rally championships yes. and all that. And even though they were only front wheel drive, that's, that's the thing that always amazed me because I've driven front wheel drive cars and I really don't like them. How do you feel about that? I like them. You like the front wheel drive? I do like the front wheel drive. All of my minis are front wheel drive. Well, that's minis. They were all well, front wheel yes, drive. That was the so, thing. So were my other cars when I had them. They were all front wheel drive. Yeah. You know, do you ever take it out in the winter? Um, not this one, no, because it's getting older and I don't want it to get moist. It stays in the garage. Yeah, good call, good call. I take my new one out all year round. Is the new one a new, new Well, it's, mini? A, two, it's a 2018, so it's new style. New and style. It doesn't have any miles on it. Now, what do you think of that as opposed to this? Um, it's more comfortable to drive, but it's not as much fun. <laughs> I wouldn't take this one on a long rally because it, no. it, it bounces around on the road and the seat uh, is the original, it's not that comfortable. Well, I appreciate you taking your time. You've got a beautiful vehicle here. I love the I love that paint job. Thank you. And I hope you have many pleasant years with it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah. Is this your car? No, I, got, I, got my, I have a GP6. I got my green one's down. Okay. Is it shorter? Well, here we are. The British lawn event at Lodge Anderson Park. And I my head is just spinning because I don't know which way to go first. Uh, I, every, everywhere I turn, I see something that I would probably do whatever I could to get one on my own. Uh, and this is, this is probably one of them. Uh, and this is a uh, 1953 MGTF. And you are the owner. That is correct. And your name? My name is Frank Cronin. Okay, Frank. Uh, now, how long have you owned this vehicle? Well, it's been in the family since 1957. My grandfather bought it, uh, brought my mother when she was 16 um, in Brooklyn, Connecticut. We saw an ad in Rhode Island, and uh, they went together to go pick it up so my mother could drive the family sedan back to the farm in Brooklyn. Uh, my grandfather, he repainted it in the mid-60s. In 1971, uh, he gave the car to my mother. And down here, you can see a picture of me. That's my mom. I'm sorry. I get Bill again. That's me down there. I'm about three years old right there. That's my dad and my Uncle Don. Um, you know, I want to interrupt, but this is something that um, when I first started being interested in British cars. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that I noticed is what they called a family car. Mm -hmm. Now, family car didn't mean something you drove everybody around it. A family car meant that it was a car that you passed on mm -hmm. from father to son to grandson to, sure. to that kind of thing. So that was a, so right there. You've proven my point as far yeah. as that goes. This is a this is a family car. Absolutely. Um, my grandfather, he collected uh, a lot of vintage cars. I think his, he loved British iron. His main thing he loved is he had a 1927 Rolls Royce uh, Phantom. Um, anyway, to make a long story short, he loved this car, uh, giving it to me. I can remember going to the Chelsea Drive-In, sitting in the booth, how I can, looking at it now, I don't know how I got in there. Um, <laughs> But it's a fun car to drive. Uh, now, me. now, how much restoration did you have to do to it? Okay, the whole the total time took us uh, ten years. Um, I worked with Pat Michael at Performance Auto. Um, I was working full time at the time, but every time I had a vacation, worked solid on a week, uh, four or five weeks during the summer, and got it to the paint. So the only thing I didn't do on the car. Is I didn't paint it, I didn't do the engine, and I do, didn't do the seats. Once everything was all painted, I assembled everything in a barn. How about some general specifications as far as the engine goes? What do you get for horsepower? It's a 1250. Uh, I think it probably gets about 57 horsepower. But it gets it to the road pretty easily. Yeah, you gotta. It's it's a high revving car. You shift it at 35, 4,000. Yeah. So yeah. it likes it. Well, it's a beauty. Thank you. It's a beauty, and you know, to me, this type of a roadster is really, well, speaking for myself, I don't think until I, until I actually had a, when I actually went to work for a company that gave me a company car, 
I never had anything that didn't have a convertible top on. I still don't have anything that has a, unless it has a convertible top on it. Yeah. And it's just one of those things. But the Roadster to me is the is the most fun you can have in four wheels with your clothes on. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time. Oh, okay. It's a beautiful car. Thank you. And we'll get some footage of it. And hopefully we'll try to keep cool. Yeah. That's a that's gonna be a chore today. <laughs> graduate to the upper echelon in the British vehicles. This is a real beauty too. Uh, and here's the owner and your name is? Fred Hammerley. And this beautiful example is a? Jaguar XK140 MC. It stands for special equipment. It's got the high horsepower motor in it. Oh, I thought it had air conditioning or something. No, no. You put the top down for that. <laughs> no AC. So what is the special equipment? It's a higher lift cam and uh, larger ports in the heads. And it's called the seat type cylinder head. It makes 210 horsepower. It doesn't sound like a lot by today's standards. No, but, in those days. But in 1955, that was a lot of horsepower. All right, and it, and it gets it to the road really good. Right. Yeah, the one thing about the Jaguars is that they're just beautiful vehicles. The, the guy that invented, or not invented, but I remember the story about when they came up with the E-Type. The E-Type was supposed to be at a show, and I guess they missed it or something. So the guy that designed it bought one, drove it to the show, and they sold like 200 of them that day. <laughs> That's the case, absolutely. But they all started with these vehicles, and, and I think I think my favorite is the D. But the, the, these vehicles, as far as... Well, if you can find a D today... Good luck. D-Type, well... Get your checkbook for a few you million bet. dollars. You bet. There are very few of those around. They you were bet. race cars, basically. So let me have some statistics on this vehicle. Now, you, you had to do a complete restoration on this? I did, but it was many, many years ago. Um, basically, left some things intact. For example, part of the dashboard has the original leather on it. I wanted to preserve what I could and then repair or replace what I couldn't preserve. And. Uh, it was about 35 years ago that it went through its, its restoration. And over the years since then, I've kept it up and, you know, with maintenance. And uh, as you can see, you know, I've got a fair amount of wax on it. And no, it's, it's a beautiful paint. I mean, did, did you have it painted? I did. You did a beautiful job. Yeah, I mean, well, this, flawless. This is a paint that you can no longer get. It's called acrylic lacquer. Oh. It's now been... you got to sand your brains out. Well, some of that, but it makes it for a much deeper shine than right. some of the more modern uh, water-based paints. Right. But the EPA decided that the solvents in lacquer were not good for the environment. So about what do they know? Yeah, right. About 10 years ago, this type of paint was banned. Right. And, and so how about the engine? The, uh, what, how big is the engine again? Yeah, it's 3.4 liter Jaguar engine with two SU downdraft carburetors on it. And uh, basically, as I said earlier, it makes 210 horsepower versus the standard, which was 195 in 1955. And okay, now you mentioned a, a touchy thing with me, because I, I had three cars too. But um, do you do your own tuning? I do. You tune, you have unisync for your carburetor? I do. Isn't that fun? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you remember. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Yeah. But they, but when they're right, they're right, and they work. Right, right. So it really is a, it really is a beautiful vehicle. And well, it's thank a beautiful you. job. Yeah. And thank I'm you. still noticing though that I, I think the one thing is people don't, I don't think people even know what these are anymore. Uh, it has knockoffs Knock on the wheels, wheels which is, is it's just a one one whack to take the wheel to take the wheel off. That's correct. To, to get that spinner off and that's what tightens the wheel. Right. Yeah. I always I always wanted those by that. What do I know? No lug nuts. No lug nuts, that's right. <laughs> well I appreciate your time. You have okay. a beautiful vehicle. Well here. thank you for and stopping I hope you many by. years of pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Anyways, this is the newest and, and really probably some of the most beautiful cars on the road. Um, and let's let's see, let's let's 
that the thoughts this is the great. 2006. And, and, can I have your name? Dick Cooper. And this is, give me some statistics on you. Uh, this is a normally aspirated car, which is what they were in 2006. I've modified it a lot. It's 311 pounds oh, less than the stock one. Cool. So it's 1,668 pounds. It has... You know what you throw out? The mother in or something? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the wife. Oh. Uh, so it's got a lowered suspension and a lot of billet parts. I own a machine shop, so I've made a lot of the parts oh, in this wow. car. Oh, wow. Handy. So, yeah, it's uh, I really enjoy it. And uh, now how long have you owned it? Uh, four years now. Is and it trouble-free driving? Uh, pretty much. We track these cars, both Henry and I, um, at the local tracks in uh, Thompson, Connecticut. Is oh, wow. Of them, it's in New Hampshire. Oh. Palmer, Mass. has a nice one. So How high you get it down the street? Uh, me, I'm only about 115 or so. He's a little higher because he's got a bunch of horsepower. So I let him go by. <laughs> They're beautiful cars, though. It's so, a lot of fun. So moving right along here, now we have the red car. Nobody has Doesn't anybody buy green it's cars? It's actually connected to the roof. The roof uh, I, as much as that is a lotus color, no. I've never it's had a, a green lotus. That's what my mind was, BRG. Yes, there you go. And so yours is a, and your name is? I'm Henry Fisher, and this is a 2010 S260 Sport. Uh, lotus. So 2010 uh, was basically the last year. They brought a couple cars in in 2011. This car is only one of 29 that we brought in the United States. Perhaps the number one out of four in our Wow. Now, it, it came with the, the turbocharger? Super. Super. Oh, even better. So, Even it's better, just, so you get it from zero. It's the same 1.8 Toyota motor, but right. they slap a supercharger on it and some fancy software. You go from about 195 horse, this was stock at about 260. Now, let me ask you this, do you do, you do your own tuning? Well, I don't do any software tuning. I do all my own work on my car. But if it came to software tuning, no, I utilize the shop out of Kansas City. Because the one thing I'm the one thing I'm going to ask the person down here that has the Alain is uh, I used to do all my own tuning, and the biggest problem was getting at the distributor. Now I'm sure this has solid state ignition. So I mean, it, it, and being it's a it's a Toyota engine, it's probably pretty trouble free. Yeah, as Ed was saying, I mean, that was probably the most brilliant move that Lotus ever did. Lotus had done work for Toyota, I believe, on suspension tuning work in the early 70s. And Lotus came back to them in the late 90s and said, hey, we want your motor. And they kind of put up a little bit of a fight initially, and then they finally agreed. And as Ed said, I mean, it's a bulletproof platform. Right. It is super reliable. It's very inexpensive to maintain. Oh, that's you know, that's a relative thing. Well, it, it really, from a from the drivetrain standpoint, right. it really is because right. they just don't break. And you can buy, you know, an oil back filter in here for, a for six bucks. Now, all right. These cars, like I, we just we were discussing here with the Toyota Range. Um, when they had, are there any similarities between these engines and the old Cosworths that used to be, like mine had the Cosworth twin, twin cob, um, twin cam, cross flow head, all that. Um, are there any similarities? Because you know what my hero, Colin Chapman's theory was, that if it didn't make it go faster or handle better, you didn't need it. So what do you think on it? Is, does, it does it hold true to his? Uh, I would say so. I mean, they didn't they didn't waste any uh, That's not true. any time doing silly things that are heavy or anything like that. But it's not an exotic engine. The only thing that's different it's variable valve timing, and it also actually has two cams, two sets of cam loads. So when you hit somewhere between five and six thousand RPM goes to what we call the high cam 
which is a longer duration, higher lift, and you get a big horsepower boost. So is it on the same cam? Is it a variable timing? It actually has a split rocker arm. One part of the rocker arm is on one cam lobe, and the other is on the floating on the other, and then a pin locks it at high RPM, and it goes on the big cam. It's an unusual mechanism. Well, I now is, is yours the same way? Same one. Yeah. Really? Exactly. And, and parts of the software that I had written for my car is that said the original stock transition was 6,200 RPMs, which many guys feel is just a little too high, so mine was brought down 1,000 RPMs to 5,200 RPMs. My little 1,600 CC was 7,000. Well, I'm not talking about redline. I'm, oh. I'm, I'm not talking about redline. I'm talking about cam transition. Oh, cam. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay these cars okay. redline at 8,500. Yeah, I was just going to say, I can't yeah. believe that they'd be that slow, that yeah, low. Yeah. It's a cam transition. Right. Well, I'm jealous of you guys. All right. I'm nice. jealous, 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 jealous. But I appreciate you taking the time. They're beautiful vehicles. And uh, if one of them becomes missing, you know where to find it. We'll look for uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank All right, you so I appreciate your time. your time and have a All great day. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Moving right along. Now we've walked across and come across something that, you know, people say, well, it's a, it's a car. This isn't a car. This is, I consider this history. Uh, let's, let's, let's talk to the owner. And the owner is Tom Clifford. And this is a, a 1963 289 AC Cobra. It's a very early one. Uh, it's number 2072, and it actually has uh, worm and sector steering. It doesn't have the rack and pinion steering, and right. it doesn't have the vents in the side. But it, it was their early car. You know, it just got a single braking system and all that. Right. So. Well, I changed that if I were you. Yeah, no, I, That's I, how I lost my car. Oh, I I just leave it all original. I yeah. a lot of people flare the fenders and put on bigger tires, but I'm I'm still running on the bias ply tires, really? which I love because it. Uh, you can burn them till they smoke. Right, right. But you you can feel them and lose it and, and get it back. Because right. I ran radials for a year, and when you lost the car, you went for a serious. Uh, yeah, you have to you have to tune it for radials. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, okay, but now here, this is this is what made me cry. How much did you pay for this car? Thirty four hundred dollars. <laughs> I still hesitate. I got a little tear underneath my glasses here. Thirty well, five hundred. I beat him down. I beat him down a hundred bucks. Thirty four hundred. And I, I told him, I said, you shouldn't need me driving this car on the street because he says it's an everyday driver. Now, I don't know where you live. I, but you said you even drove in the winter. Oh yeah, no, I drive in the winter. But what it was, I I realized I couldn't drive it in snow. One day I was I because I was going to work and there was snow and I spun out twice on my own street. So then I went back, put it in the garage. You didn't have snow tires. Oh, no, 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 which didn't help, but it, it wouldn't, it just got too much power for snow. And then I bought like and a... no weight in the rear, right? Right. So I bought a, a car that was even worse, a 71 Mustang, as my everyday driver for the winter. And then I drive this week, my car in the summer. And on a two-week vacation once, I drove this out to uh, California, Laguna Seca, ran it around the track, and then drove it back. So put an instant uh, 7,000 miles, or 6,500 miles on the car. You know what I call that? Stupid. Living the dream. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Living the dream. I don't know. I, you know what? I, 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 I had no, I'm really lost for words on this guy because it's something that you, you often see because so many, you know, people make them manufacturers. Right. Uh, the, this is, there's more replicas of this than a, any other car in the world. Exactly. It, you know? yeah. That's why when I walked up to it, the first thing I did was put my hand under the, yeah. under the wheel well to, to, to see if it was aluminum. aluminum. And the first yeah. thing you said to me was, don't lean against it. Right, right. Why? Because right. it'll dent. I mean, it's really pa paper thin. It's a light, lightweight car. So. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, hey, I appreciate you taking your time. Right. Very good. Nice to meet and you. It's a beautiful car. Yeah. And I still think you should put it in a vault. No, no, I, you, you got to use them. And I don't cover it. Like at night, I've got a couple cars in the garage. I just like to go out and look at it. You take the garbage out, you just, you can stand there. What do, there I, what do I have to do to get in your will? <laughs> a couple of people. One guy, if I don't give him this when, I, when I'm gone, is that. Uh, Dig me up and uh, <laughs> do something bad. To me. Well, I'll already be dead. So. <laughs> yeah, really, who cares? Right, right. I appreciate your time. Very good. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Oh, there you go.
now I'm really getting into the nostalgia in my life. Uh, we were out with another Lotus, but this one is near and dear to my heart because I actually owned a model like this, only mine was a little older than this. Uh, and we're here with the owner of the car, and his name is? John Siegel. And what, what is this? It's a 1970 Lotus Elan. And it was an, it's an S4, though? Yes, right, sir. Which means more power. A uh, little bit, a little bit. Oh, you only need a little bit. In this car, you only need a little bit. <laughs> now, how long have you had the vehicle? Uh, I've had this for about five years. Five years? Did you have to do any restoration on it? Oh, enormous amount. Yeah. Look, look nothing like this when I buy it. Yeah. Really? I mean, they do, I mean, that's one of the things, I know, at least in my experience, you had to like to work on cars if you owned one of these. Oh, yeah, I love it. That's what I do. <laughs> well, we, we were discussing, my, my major sticking point was trying to get at the distributor. And uh, you told me a few things, but this, this has a solid state ignition, so you don't have to adjust points the way I right. did, which was a major chore. But, you do but it once and then you go to an electronic ignition. Exactly. They didn't have them when I bought it. But anyways, this, have you, have you had to replace the, the vacuum balls on the lights? Well, actually, I removed the vacuum and the lights. I put an electric motor to run the lights. Smart move. Right. So there's no, there's no vacuum for the lights. The, yeah. the vacuum there's going to the power brakes that I put in, actually. That's why I lost mine, <laughs> because they'd only had a single master cylinder. Most modern cars have dual master yeah. cylinders. So I lost, once, once, I, once you lose one, you lose everything. And I was in the middle of Harvard Square during the rush hour. Wow. I went under a Corvair. <laughs> but that's history, and I try to forget it. Anyway, so now, what, what do you think are the best things about a Lotus? Uh, well, it handles beautifully, um, and, it's, and it's quick because it's so light. It's all fiberglass. Exactly. Have you had to try and change one of those Rotaflex units on the rear end? I removed them, actually. I put, a, I put a, um, CV joint half shafts in. So, it's so you've made all the correct changes as far as I'm concerned, so far. So far, all the things I thought, my God, how would they design this like this? You've, done, you've made the correct changes, and I, I, I really commend you on that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it, it's, to me, uh, the engine was the most beautiful part of the whole car. Yeah, the uh, nice. Now, you, you fig how many horsepower do you figure you get out of this? Uh, you know, I don't know. I'm guessing maybe 120 to 130, probably max. That's doing good, though. Yeah. Well, the car's very light, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. How, yeah. how much do you figure this weighs? Car weighs about 1,500 pounds. Yeah, I was, I, actually, mine was a little heavy. But anyways, I, like I say, I commend you on your changes well, because you. they're the ones, those are the things that used to drive me nuts. Uh, was 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 those those few things and they all went right so you had to change them but i appreciate you taking the time it's a beautiful car and if you find it missing by the end of the show uh don't come looking for me <laughs> Thank you very much. all right have a great show bye-bye nice these fantastic lawn events and if you're hungry Cutterham grill the food is ready all right, as usual, here at the Los Anderson Lawn events, I can always be assured to come up with the, the most unusual and unique vehicles that I can find. And I come across one that is Probably, I don't know if even people even know what this is, um, but it is a? 1974 TVR 2500M. And you're the owner? Yes. Your name? Oh, Chris Gibbons. That's, you know. It's an incident, it doesn't matter. Now, how long have you had the car? Uh, six years. Six years? Yeah. Did you have to do, you had to do a lot of restoration, I hear. To the body. I did the restoration to the body because there was a crack developed and we found a lot underneath. So I begrudgingly did it, yeah. Okay. We re, re the entire car. We took away every single right angle around there so there wouldn't be any more cracking. 
Um, and we found that, that when it was made from the factory, it wasn't symmetrical at all. So we straightened a lot of the body out uh, and a lot of the errors that were happening from the factory, which was really funny. Yeah, I, sometimes British guys, I remember when somebody told me once that if you, if, if you don't see oil on the floor, you're out of oil. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true for this guy. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, give me some, excuse me, I have to spit. Statistics on, on this guy. Yeah. Uh, so it's a four point. For luck. Yeah, thank you. It's a four point three liter uh, V6, um, and it has a uh, Nissan 300Z differential in the back. Um, so it, it's a Chevy drivetrain. It's a Chevy truck. Hold on, hold on, let me stop you there. Is it a transaxle? Uh, no, it's uh, it's um, just the rear end. Just the rear end is off a of 360Z, so it's, uh, it's, it's CV axles. Okay. I thought, because a lot of cars sometimes, especially one as light as this and as short as this, they'll put the transaxle in the back so it's a weight differential. I, I, I definitely would like a little bit more weight in the back, but um, right. I think I'll correct that with a giant uh, sway bar in the front. Yeah. Hey. Well, not, when I first started talking to her, I said the, the biggest problem you have with this car is trying to keep the rear wheels behind the front wheels. That's not a problem because I don't let off the gas. <laughs> Hey, it's 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 not a joke. This no, car's fat. No, I drive no. the hell out of it. I mean, this car is driven hard and put away wet. You know, I mean, I think I I th I've been trying to think of a word to describe people that own British cars, and I think uh, I think the number one thing with people that own British cars is the FF factor, which is the fun factor. Yes. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, because a lot of times there's a lot of work involved in British cars, which, you know, is okay, but when you're done with it, you just can't wait to get behind the wheel and take it out. This is the 3F factor for this car. All right, what's the third F? The first F would be the effing fun factor. All right, I'll go along with that. So, All right, we can censor it. You know, hey, that was already censored. <laughs> But it sounds great. It has a stainless steel exhaust on it. The exhaust note, that's what made me want to buy it, besides it being a TVR. Um, it, it's a fantastic car. It's, it's a handful. It's, what do you think is top speed on something like this? <laughs> I don't like to go over 100 in this, um, but it, you know, a cruise at, on the highway regularly doing 90 in fifth gear at 3,000 or 3,100 RPMs. But people tell me it can go 150. There's no way. This thing will flip over before that happens. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, but depends on what road you run. But anyways, I appreciate your time. It's a beautiful car. Thank you very I, much. I hope you have a great rest of your day. I do too. I'm, as long as we're in the shade, I think it's better over here. Yeah. So over there is, I'm starting to get baked. Hey. But anyways, thanks again for your time. It's have a beautiful a car, day. and I hope you have many, many fun years with it. Thank you, sir. Have a good have one. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Oh, not for a while. What's the name of the... Great American Spectator. Gas. Oh, my God. Great American Spectator. <laughs> <laughs> Continuing my search for the rare and unusual, and I, I think I've hit the jackpot here. <laughs> we were walking by this, and I didn't know whether it was somebody's bicycle or what, but uh, turns out it wasn't. It is a... 1903 Dickinson Moret, made in Birmingham, England. And you are? Richard Friedman. You've, how long have you owned this? Since 1980. Since 1980? Yeah. Now... I was going to say, you know, have you had to restore it, but really not a whole lot to restore, is there? Well, it was missing half the engine, so I had to make the, uh, the timing side crankcase and camshaft and ignition timing, the crankshaft connecting rod. Is it a four-cycle or a two-cycle? It's a, it's a, it's a four-stroke atmospheric inlet. It only has an exhaust cam. The inlet is by suction. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Typical British. How does that work? Well, it has a very weak spring on the inlet valve. So when the piston comes down, it pulls the inlet valve open and allows the mixture to pass. You, you, got, you, you got me that, speechless here. That was common on stationary engines. Because, really? Yeah, because to make, make a set, they, they needed to manufacture an exhaust cam, which costs money, but to also make an inlet cam costs money also. So it was cheaper to just have a suction operated inlet, which is fine for a slow running engine. Okay. But, uh, but for a high-speed engine, you need a stronger spring on the valve, 
and therefore it won't work on uh, by suction. Now, how do you start it? You spin the flywheel by hand. I love this thing already. But I notice, I mean, it's such a basic machine. I mean, it's chain drive, flywheel, and the brakes. I don't know. Do you, have you ever changed the belts? The, I, the brakes are belts. Well, they were originally leather lined on a flat pulley, and I replaced them with a woven asbestos lining, and they're over effective. I, you know, I don't need all the braking capacity that they supply. So you lock up the rear wheels a lot? Yeah, well, they, they bring me to a stop. Of course, when you're going a few miles an hour, coming to a stop isn't that much of a problem. And not to be, you know, a few miles an hour is probably all you can really do in this thing, isn't it? I did hit 15 a few years ago, going up down a slight, ingra uh, slight grade, but I think I can do better. With the wind behind you? Well, down, down a slight grade. <laughs> I love this thing. But I mean, it's 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 such a basic thing of machinery. It almost reminds me of the early Benz, uh, with the, the instead of having a steering wheel, you have a tiller, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's really uh, such a basic machine that I'm surprised there weren't more. I mean. Did they sell a lot of these in its day? This was a failure of a design. This may the, be the, the there was probably only a handful manufactured. And this, I believe, is the only existing one. Now, is that a, is, would you consider that a regular bicycle tire? That is a modern cruiser tire. The original, I have pieces of the original tire casing. Uh, all, the, all the natural rubber has rotted away, so it's just canvas wrapping on a wire base. Really? Um, but they, were, they did have pneumatic tires um, made out of unvulcanized rubber, which turned out to be white. Really? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, you know, I think so far in today, uh, this takes the prize for the most unique uh, that I've come across. When I saw this, I, I wasn't even sure what it was at first. Mm -hmm. But when I came over and I saw you here and I started talking to you, it really piqued my interest. So I really appreciate your time. Okay. It's a beautiful piece of machinery. Thanks very and much. And I hope you keep it for a long, long time. I will. Take care. Okay. Bye. Yeah. season for lotus sort of i guess i don't know i'm not sure but it's still i still love these things and uh we have two that i, I think they're basic, basically uh, originally were a kit car called a lotus 7 but now they've become so popular that aftermarkets have started making them um and let's see let's start with this one here your name is anchorbergs and what is this uh, this is a 1987 uh, Caterham 1700 Super Springs. Okay, so it's a Caterham. Yeah, it's a Caterham because what happened was Lotus decided to s sell the rights to right. the Seven. Right. And they sold it to their main dealer, okay. who was C Caterham Motor Cars. Okay. And they started, they, they got all the, uh, all the manufacturing. Uh, equipment and all the parts, and they built them, and they still build them. Uh -huh. This is not a kit, though. Well, you can buy them as a kit, right? But you you can also buy them as a fully assembled car. Okay. okay. Uh, in the U.S., I don't think you can register a fully assembled car. What so? What you do is you buy the kit without the engine, then you source the engine from somewhere else. 
and then you can register. That's kind of the beauty of them, really, because you can put whatever engine you want in. Yes, as long as it fits. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so we have another example over here, uh -huh. and your name is? I'm Olivier Aries. And what is this? So it's a uh, 1992 KTRAM uh, Super Sprint. It actually has the same engine as Anchors. And what's the engine in this? So it's a Ford source engine, uh, 1.7 liter, uh, we call uh, Ford Crossflow. And mine. It has a Crossflow head on it? It does, it yes. Oh, performance. It, uh, well, yeah, it's about 135 horsepower. It's enough. So considering that the car is barely a thousand pound heavy, that's, yeah, uh, yeah, pretty, that's the beauty it's of it. It's a good ratio. And, uh, this one is very, very basic. It's what they used to call the classic model. Only four-speed gearbox, and I have a live axle. And when you're in, uh, when you're hitting a pothole in a curve, you remember Bounce why it's the called place. a live axle. Yes. Yes. But live. you know, uh, to me, because I owned a Lotus, but this was one that was always in the back of my head because this, it, the original. I keep saying this, and I'm probably going to regret repeating myself over and over again. But the original designer of these cars was a guy by the name of Colin Chapman, and he designed Lotus cars. Now, his philosophy, and these were originally total kit cars, mm -hmm. racing, local racing. Yeah. And the basic principle that his, any of his Lotus cars had was if it didn't make it go faster or handle better, you didn't need it. Uh -huh. All right? And you can tell by some of the designs because they just, they're just so basic and plain. Yeah. But that's what makes them beautiful. Yeah. I think that makes them beautiful. And and Colin Chapman was trained as an uh, aeronautical engineer. Yeah. And if you're familiar with airplanes, yeah. you see a lot of elements of construction and material yeah, yeah, exactly. coming from uh, exactly. aeronautical uh, engineering just exactly. for uh, lightness. Exactly. Now, do you have the same engine in yours? Yes, exactly the same engine. Same engine. Okay. Yep. Now, do you do you both like do you tune your own engines? I we do all we the work. Our, we are ready to have uh, voting I begin. Uh, everybody who pre-registered has a little yeah, my name actually has a QR code that will take you to a website wow. where you can vote. How is that to work on? Uh, no trouble at all. It's just torsion bars, right? Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's, it actually has a pivot point. QR code here available. Well, Vote this is unique in that it actually has All right, a the voting will close right. at about 12.30. Holds the most of the, the next hour and 45 right. minutes right. to make right. your decision yeah. and vote for the best yeah. in how, what is this one? Thank you, everybody. So the live uh, axle is very so much. It's a most basic so set of the rear axle. Solid right. rear axle. The Davion you have is nearly a kind of independent yeah. rear suspension yeah. in many ways. Uh, which make those cars, I think, much more compliant. Have you ever thought of converting to independent force rear suspension? Uh, it's it's very hard to do, and I bought this car for the simplicity of it. So it's actually, wrong. I enjoy the having the most basic version of it. Jump and go. <laughs> right. Well, I appreciate your time. Well, thank you. Your cars, I'm jealous. I keep saying to anybody with owns a Lotus, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. And if you find it missing. You never heard of me. Yeah, ah. and if you come with the right amount of money, yeah. <laughs> we'll remember. Thank you again for your time. Right. Thank you for your time. No. Rolling, rolling, rolling. I'm going to be rolling on out of here pretty soon if I don't get out of this heat. It's, it's a smoker here today. But speaking of smoking, this little beauty beside me must smoke them up really good. Uh, and it is a? Aston Martin DB11. 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 Okay, and you are the owner. Your name the is? Owner. My name is Barry Breen. Barry, now how long have you, have you, have you had this vehicle? I've had this vehicle three years. It's my third Aston Martin. Uh, my original one was a Vantage. Then I moved to the Rapide, which is a four-door 12-cylinder, and I bought this in 2019. You're looking to adopt? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not really. Can't afford child support. <laughs> no, I, I mean, you know, I, this, this is a beautiful car. I mean, that's one thing, I, you know, I've been to German shows and the Italian shows. The Italians do make beautiful cars. They do make beautiful cars. But when it comes to craftsmanship, 
somehow the English just have a, that little bit more, a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, attention to detail. I have to show you one thing that I, I think most people don't realize, but these stainless steel roof strakes, uh, people look at them and say, boy, that's a really nice feature. They think it's an accent. It's actually part of the aerodynamic design. Really? It doesn't move, does it? No, it doesn't move. It takes in air here. Oh, okay. And then out through the back, spoiler. Uh, that's good for speeds under 100 miles so an hour. Spoiler comes up. Uh, after 100 miles an hour, that spoiler comes up about eight inches and gives you and some. That takes what, about three seconds. Uh, <laughs> it takes a while, yeah. but um, when they designed this car, they knew it was going to be a very fast car, and they were worried about the stability. So they thought about a whale tail that didn't last very yeah, long. Yeah, they're ugly on a college. And this. they came up with this design, and they were actually to maintain the lines of the car, and it's. Uh, I think it's a really detail, detail, detail. Oh, it's a it's a impressive thing when you first see the car strikes out. You can get these roof strakes in body color, stainless steel, yeah. or gloss black. Really yeah. nice. You know, it's funny. I speaking of detail, detail, detail. Something I I'm a I'm a follower of Formula One, and I don't know how many people actually know this, but almost I'd say more than half of your Formula One teams are located in England. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, Lotus and you McLaren and no, even Mercedes has yeah, a yeah, has a factory yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I often wonder why, but I'm assuming it's because of the workmanship that's available yeah, there. Yeah, probably. You know, it probably is something like that. Yeah, the engineering cars, they're and everything. They're all hand that. built, they're all hand assembled. Right, right. Still, you know. Now yeah. let me have some what, what what what's the engine in this? This is a, a V eight. Uh, it's got twin turbocharged uh, oh. engine. So it's a little over 500 horsepower. Wow. Zero to 60 in three seconds and some change. Very quick. It's a beautiful vehicle. Absolutely beautiful. Well, I appreciate you taking some Thank time you. with me. Very nice. And uh, good luck with it. Best of luck with it. And if you're ever. I mean, the noise. What's this? What's this? Is that All right, now we're talking masquerade. When I first saw this roll in, I thought it was a Cobra at first, it just at a quick glance. And then I thought maybe it was a Bristol. But now I walked over next to it, and of all things, it's a Triumph Spitfire. Now, it's a beautiful little car. And there's nothing against Spitfires because they were a beautiful little car. And the owner is? My name is Adam Schmalsley. All right, Adam, now uh, what is this technically? Uh, this is sort of a Frankenstein version of a Triumph Spitfire. It's a 1971 MK4. Okay. Now, uh, I was, we were talking about one of the shortcomings. Did you change that, or is it still like that? Uh, did I change the... The, the starter. Uh, the starter is actually the same starter I uh, had in the car when I originally found it. Believe it or not, I found this car in the junkyard. It was getting ready to be crushed, and I wanted to give it a second chance. I bought it in 2014. Uh, they actually sold it as individual parts. So the door had a receipt, the trunk had a receipt, the tires had receipts. Really? And then I managed to get my hands on the title, and this is where it is today. So. Wow. You yeah. know, I mean, they're they're a fairly simple car, and with the bonnet up the way it is now, working on the engine is pretty pretty easy. I I can attest to that fact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's nice. You can sit on the tires and exactly. you know. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's what, yeah. Exactly. But I mean, it's 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 a fun car to drive, and it's a fun car to own. Um, as far as if you like to work on cars, you know, I mean, they do sometimes. You know, not all, not all, but because it really it depends on you and how you keep up with it. Yeah. You know, you, you do have to keep up with it. But you know, the old <laughs> I got to laugh out of this every time I've said it so far. If you don't see oil on the floor, oh yeah, it means you're out of oil. Yeah, <laughs> I got to be careful parking in anybody's driveways because uh, no matter how many seals I replace, I'm always going to find oil drops underneath. Exactly. But. That's what I say. You got to maintain. <laughs> you got to keep up with it. Yeah. But it's yeah. but it's it's worth it because oh, yeah. it's a fun car to drive and it's a fun car to own. Yeah. Now, did you do the paint job? I did not do the paint job. I had uh, an individual who owns a small body shop. Uh, his name is Fogner in Worcester, Massachusetts, and he okay. painted the car for me. Right. Now, how long how long have you owned it? I've had it since 2014. 2014, so yeah. you've had it a while. How long did it take you to restore? 
It's kind of always being restored. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's a complete uh, restore yet. Always a work in progress. It's a work in progress. I was probably able to drive it for the first time seven months or so after I first got it. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, gee, you know, it's a beautiful thing. You did a beautiful job. Thank I mean, you. it looks very clean. Very, you know, they're a, like I said, they're a simple car, but yeah. still they're a fun car to drive and a fun car to own. Yeah. And I appreciate you taking your time. Yeah, thank you very All right? much. All right. Have a great day. Thank Hopefully you, you can get hydrated. I know yeah. I'm going to, I feel like just dumping the water on my oh, head. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have a great day. Registration desk. I had a camera on. All right, it's time for Get Smart. And if you ever watched that show, Get Smart, you would have seen one of the cars that we're looking at right now. And it is a? 1965 Sunbeam Tiger. Sunbeam Tiger. Pretty fast car. It, they had a little sister called the Alpine, but this is a completely different car. And uh, your name is? Ralph Trapanier. Now, how long have you owned this? About four years now. Four years? I understand you had to do a little work on it when you got it. Yeah, it had a little bit of a crunch in the front from someone who wasn't able to stop in time. A unique problem in English cars, probably, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> That's how I lost my car. One of my English cars was no brakes. But anyways, um, so you had to, is that the only amount of restoration you had to do? Yeah, it was just basically getting the front sheet metal to look right again. And um, um, it took about a year to put it together because there's no aftermarket parts for the bodywork on these cars. Right. Because nothing is actually replaceable. The whole body's welded together on this car. Unibody type thing. But it's not bolted together. No. It's all full seam welded. Right. Okay. So once the body's put together, it's not made to come apart again. Right. Well it kind of makes it stronger too, considering. It probably does. Yeah, right, exactly. So now um, this has a two sixty is it a Ford engine? It's a Ford engine, yeah. Two sixty V eight. Apparently the deal that I heard was that when Shelby American was convincing AC to run the 289s in it, the AC group had a problem with Shelby encouraging 289s for these cars. So Ford agreed to sell the 260 V8s, which they were phasing out, okay. and gave them a deal right. on, on lots of them. Right. So you lucked out with the 260. Actually, 260 isn't a bad engine. It's a nice engine. It's um, fast enough for that car. Without a doubt, without a doubt. So now, uh, so once you got it all restored and everything, uh, have you had any other issues with it at all? Well, everything was great until today. And we won't go into that. Yeah. <laughs> no, the car's been rock solid, runs cool. If you understand air management to get the engine to stay cool, they work fine. Yeah. I think a lot of the historical info on these cars is that people just didn't understand how to handle these things. Well, that's the same with all British cars, though, I think. Well, anyways, it's a beautiful little car. Uh, I think you're going to have lots of fun with it. Thank I appreciate you. your time. Appreciate talking. Have a great day. Try and stay out of the sun. I love it. <laughs> Hit the shade. <laughs> the upper end of the echelon with the Aston Martins, but I think we've hit the pinnacle here. Uh, just what we were on our way out, and we just happened to run across this bad boy. And it is a... This is a 1930 Rolls-Royce, a 2025 horsepower. The body is made by a French bodybuilder named Kellner, K-E-L-L-N-E-R, and the, under, the chassis engine Electric, all of that is original Rolls Royce. Now you hit on something that is back in the day it was common, but 
cars like this were for instance, I don't know what the Rolls Royce actually built their own bodies at any time. They did, but they, most of them were done by separate coach builders. Coach builders, Bruce Stern in New York, was very popular in America. Kellner, Rolls Royce had several captive coach builders in England, and so the uh, the uh, coach building was really an industry of itself. The right. carry forward from the carriage industry. Right, exactly, exactly. Speaking of horse-drawn carriages, when Henry Ford created the mass production, he used as a model the carriage building in Amesbury, Massachusetts, really? which today is known as the Detroit of carriages, because they mass produced all different kinds of carriages, who sold them in boxes to Sears, Robert, that's why I love these shows. You learn, I, no, I, I have yet to come to one of these shows where I don't learn something new. Well, something I never, I never one even of the, thought One of. of the fun parts about this car, yes, it's fun to drive and yes, it's unique. We don't know of any other body like this, but it's the stories behind it. And if you'd like, I'd be delighted to, to share it. Well, we're all, we're all begging you. That's the only <laughs> So, so we, we've been here. We've been here for a couple of hours now. We're pretty much fried. all right. Well, but anyways, the, you know, the one question I did want to have you explain to people was that you said that this only has 25 horsepower. Okay. Now, this car must weigh a couple of tons. Oh, no, it weighs it, it weighs a little over a ton, about 2,500 pounds. But the designation 2025 is a designation to be accommodated to the British taxing system. They taxed cars on what were called horsepower, and horsepower were calculated more as the ability to move weight right. than they were SAE or foot-pounds. Right. And so Rolls, not Royce, but Rolls went to the taxing authority with his engineers and said, this is a car that we're calling a 2025 horsepower because that had a very low excise tax. Whereas the cars that in fact had 70, 80, 100 horsepower and roads built them, a much higher tax. But this was a 2025 because of the way that it was classified by the taxing authorities. Had nothing to do with with foot pounds. Yeah. Nothing to do with foot pounds. Now, there's something else that you you, you just did on it. Is this a Rolls or a Rolls Royce? Well, it, it, it is a Rolls Royce. But Rolls Royce was a company formed by two people, Mr. Right. Rolls and Mr. Royce. Royce. Right. Right. That's why I was just. I don't know how many people actually know that fact. Right. You know, it's, they it's, need to come to shows like this and learn. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Good for you. That's why I'm here. But you know what? It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful. I mean, that's the one thing about these vehicles like this is, like you say, the carriage-built bodies were always so unique and so detailed that they, you could put any kind of a body you wanted. On you one you of these could, vehicles. and they did. And the 2025 chassis, which Rolls mass produced the chassis and the engine and the steering column and the electrical system. Right. And they would crank these out and make them available under the 2025 horsepower to buyers who could then have their own coach builder to put on what they wanted. Rolls had three or four models in the 20s. Right. I've forgotten the designation. Right, right. But this one was built sort of on an assembly line. Right. I don't know how many a week or a month they were built, but they were they were built for inventory and then sold rather than being built one at a time for somebody to buy and put a carriage, their own carriage. Well, you're a bank of information. I really appreciate you taking your time. Not at all. Beautiful enjoyed, vehicle. I enjoy And I hope you enjoy many years Well, thank with you. It. We will. And, and uh, being at a show like this gives us a chance to share stories with other people. And yeah, you, I, wish, when you come I back, wish the sun was shaded a little bit. Oh, I could spend an hour with you. Baby, come yeah. back. Oh, we'll be we'll back. Be here. We'll be back. We well, usually come for these lawn events. And, uh, and we'll do a, uh, I've got some wonderful history because the cars themselves are beautiful and right. works of art. Right. Works of art. But it's the stories and the people them. 
that go with the chassis and the engine. Right. Sure. It. So I'd love to share that with you. I'd love to have a shed. Thank you both. All right. Well, you have a Thanks. wonderful day. Oh, yeah. This program is brought to you in part by Pro-Am Embroidery. Pro-Am Embroidery for all your embroidery needs. Call us at 781-662-8888. Or better yet, come see us at our brand new location at 139 Linwood Avenue in Melrose, Mass. Pro-Am, a proud supporter of WizBank Productions and MMTV.